We're resurrecting our video series covering the accidents and tragedies of the Chicago, Aurora, and Elgin Railway, an electric interurban that once spanned from Chicago to the Fox River, but went out of business in the late 1950s. The vast majority of the CA&E's former right-of-way has been converted to two well-loved trails, the Illinois Prairie Path and the Fox River Trail. In this episode, we begin in Kane County, once again along the Fox River in the city of Aurora, near the River Edge Park. The Aurora branch was part of the original 1902 build of the AE&C Railway, being 14 and a half miles in length and having 17 station stops along the line. We'll start here and explore the incidents, accidents, and tragedies of the Aurora branch during its 55 years of operation. Our primary sources for this video come from contemporary reports from local newspapers in Northeast Illinois. We've supplemented this newspaper information with census records, grave records, and vital records. Our first story took place along the trackway nearby the Illinois Avenue station, which stood just across Illinois Avenue behind us. In August of 1914, 46-year-old Nicholas Millen, who lived but a short distance east on Aurora Avenue, was said to have sleptwalked onto the AE&C trackway at about 1.30 a.m., dressed only in his underclothes. A short time later, a Chicago-bound AE&C train found the remains of his body, electrocuted and lying between the third rail and the running rail. In April of 1927, 46-year-old horseman Peter D. Hacks from Fullerton, California, along with horse jockey Jack May, we're driving west on their way to the Exposition Park race course, located on the west side of the Fox River. As they were passing over the CA&E crossing, just east of the Illinois Avenue Bridge, their auto was struck by a Chicago-bound CA&E train heading north. Hacks was killed outright, and May was seriously injured. The abandoned stretch of railway behind us, between Illinois Avenue and Aurora Avenue, was the scene of at least a few deadly CA&E accidents over the years. In September of 1937, 46-year-old World War I veteran and foundry worker, John Jungles, was killed while walking along the railway line when he was struck by a passing CA&E train. He left a wife, Catherine. In the same vicinity of the 1937 death, 46-year-old Dale E. Greer from Burlington, Iowa, was walking along the right-of-way in August of 1958. A nearby resident called the police to tell them that they feared for the man's safety as he was stumbling along the tracks. By the time the police arrived, Dale Greer had fallen against the third rail and the running rail and had been electrocuted and killed. Our next story took place near the Aurora Avenue station, which stood just behind us here. The story borders on the comical, but can be considered a tragedy for the sport of angling. In March of 1911, two young men, Louis Cohn and William Philatz, were arrested for tapping into the AE&C electrical wiring near where the railroad track crosses a culvert at Aurora Avenue. They were using the tapped wire and electricity to kill fish in the Fox River. The police charged them with malicious mischief. However, a truly tragic accident did occur here in June of 1928 at the Aurora Avenue crossing just behind us here. 
During the afternoon of June 3, 1928, Edwin May was driving his delivery truck from Batavia, along with his four-year-old son, Edwin May Jr., and two other boys. Traveling southbound along Aurora Avenue, he drove towards the CAE crossing, which met the road at a 45-degree angle. Apparently, he did not hear the train whistle or see the warning signals, and proceeded ahead through the crossing. In a moment, his truck was struck by an Aurora-bound CA&E train, traveling at about 35 miles per hour. Edwin May was found lying on the ground in a dazed condition, with his son in his arms, who had been killed in the accident. The other two boys in the truck had been thrown clear of the wreckage and suffered only minor injuries. Our next story occurred at the Church Road crossing, close to the Church Road station behind us. Here on the afternoon of November 6, 1924, 63-year-old John C. Tweed of DeKalb, Illinois, the father of nine children, was killed by a CAME train. His Ford truck collided with an eastbound CAME train traveling at 40 miles per hour at the Church Road crossing, hurling his vehicle more than 60 feet. Mr. Tweed apparently did not see or heed the crossing's warning lights. Our next location takes us to the Deal Road crossing. In mid-December of 1938, 28-year-old principal of Oswego High School, husband and father of two children, George Melvin Attig, told his wife he was going for a drive and would be back in a short while. A short time later, at dusk, Melvin Attig parked his car near the lonely Deal Road crossing. He left his watch on the car seat left the car keys in the glove compartment, and then waited by the crossing for an approaching eastbound train. When the train was but a few hundred feet away, Melvin Attig jumped between the rails, placed one arm over his head, and ran towards the speeding train. Moments later, he was killed instantly. Subsequent inquiries into his death suggested intimidation and harassment by some Oswego students and their parents as being a possible cause. Our next story tells how paying your income taxes can sometimes prove fatal. A short distance northwest of the Ferry Road Station, here at the Illinois Route 59 crossing, 45-year-old Ralph E. Maloney from Warrenville was heading south on Route 59 one foggy February morning in 1944. He was on his way to the post office to file his income taxes. As he approached the crossing, he saw and heard the warning signals and dutifully stopped his automobile to allow for the passing train. A truck following behind him, however, did not see his stopped automobile in the fog and struck him from behind, pushing his auto into the path of the passing CA&E train. Mr. Maloney died of his injuries from the crash. In the early morning hours in late October of 1913, an eastbound A, E, and C train 
moving at a high speed of 60 miles per hour, was coming out of the curve from the southwest. It hit a large metal object that had been accidentally dropped on the tracks by an earlier work train. The train crashed into the object and jumped the rails at high speed. The train turned over a few times as it crashed into a ditch along the line, smashing the train cars to pieces. Conductor Martin P. Whitney, age 33, was killed when he jumped from the train as it derailed. The train crushed him as it rolled over. Motorman William Fortmeyer was also seriously injured in the accident. In early September of 1917, Florence Williams, age 49, of Warrenville, was out taking a drive with Daniel Newcomer of Naperville when they approached the Williams Road crossing behind us. Being very knowledgeable of the daily train schedule, they thought it was safe to proceed through the crossing. But having forgotten it was Sunday, which had a different train schedule, their automobile collided with the train as they crossed. killing Florence Williams and seriously injuring Dan Newcomer. With some irony, the AENC railway crossing and stop was named for the Williams family, who were wealthy farmers and landowners in the area. Late in the morning, in late July of 1929, four members of a wedding party, including the newlyweds, the best man, and the bridesmaid, were approaching the Williams Road crossing in an automobile. They had previously left their wedding party early to avoid hazing by family and friends. As they came to the Williams Road crossing, they disregarded the warning lights in an attempt to beat the train, which was bearing down from the east at 40 miles per hour. The train collided with the auto, killing all four passengers. The groom, Joseph Wojtkiewicz, age 24, a machinist from Chicago. The bride, Lillian Olmsted, age 19, an office clerk from Cicero. The best man, Joseph Kaczynski, age 24, also a machinist from Chicago. And the bridesmaid, Christine Libera, age 26, a clerk from Chicago. The Warrenville substation that once stood behind us and the Batavia Road crossing just to the east were the site of multiple accidents over the years. In May of 1904, AENC power station worker Byron McLean was electrocuted while working with a 26,000 volt wire at the Warrenville substation. He fortunately survived the incident, but his right arm was very badly burned. He was taken to the Aurora Hospital, where months of skin grafting operations and therapy saved much of his arm. In early December of 1923, 22-year-old farmer Clifford Nichols was driving along Batavia Road, along with his fiancée Eleanor Triplett and her nephew, when they approached the Batavia Road crossing behind us here which is just a few hundred feet east of the Warrenville substation. Heading north, Nichols noticed the crossing warning lights and to his left saw a speeding train heading east towards the station and the crossing. He incorrectly guessed that the train would stop at the Warrenville station. As his car proceeded over the railroad line, his automobile stalled, and the train, being an express, passed by the Warrenville station at speed then colliding with the stalled vehicle at the Batavia Road crossing. Nichols was killed outright, while both his fiancée and her three-year-old nephew escaped serious injury. In early October of 1937, an automobile carrying three teenagers collided with a speeding eastbound CA&E train at the Batavia Road crossing behind me. The driver, Charles James, age 16, was killed, while his two passengers, John Mack and William Almdale, age 15 and 17, 
suffered serious injuries. During a rainstorm in early September of 1953, 22-year-old Herman J. Nolting of Gary, Indiana, had just left his parents' home in Warrenville after having had a visit with them. Perhaps due to the driving rain, he did not see the warning lights at the Batavia Road crossing, and his automobile was struck by a passing ca &E train, killing the young Nolting instantly. The Montview Crossing behind me was the site of multiple misfortunes over the years. In early April of 1915, the crossing was the site of a very bad accident that occurred during a family outing on Easter Sunday. The Dirks family was driving to Aurora, with Bruno Dirks of Forest Park driving. His 27-year-old wife, Helen Grunert Dirks, was sitting next to him, and her younger brother and sister were sitting in the back seat. Witnesses to what followed said that the Montview crossing was unprotected by warning signals, and so most motorists would stop before the crossing, get out of their autos, and check for a train before proceeding forward. The Dirks, however, inched up to the crossing in their automobile, not hearing the oncoming train, perhaps due to the noise of their own engine. Their automobile was hit square on by a speeding train. The force of the collision hurling the automobile tens of feet in the air and throwing the occupants clear of the wreckage, save one, Helen Dirks. She was trapped in the wrecked automobile. Miraculously, Bruno Dirks was only slightly injured, but staggered over to the wrecked car only to find that his wife had been killed by the collision with a fractured skull. Her two siblings were also seriously injured in the crash. Thirteen years later, another terrible tragedy occurred at this very dangerous crossing. In early October of 1928, two sisters, Margaret Bolweg, age 21, and Helen Bolweg, age 18, were driving to their home in Warrenville on a drizzly day after working a full day at the DuPage County Abstract Office in Wheaton. Not too far from their home, driving along Winfield Road in the drizzling rain, their small sedan was struck by an eastbound ca &E train traveling 50 miles per hour at the unguarded Montague crossing, destroying the automobile and carrying it more than 400 feet along the trackway. A spark from the shorted third rail lit the automobile's ruptured gas tank, which burst into flames. The horrified train crew and passengers attempted to put out the fire but both the automobile and the two young women inside were consumed by the blaze. The two young sisters were burned beyond recognition. Margaret and Helen Bolwig were buried in St. Michael Cemetery in Wheaton. Our next location is the Weesbrook Crossing, where the railway met the road at a sharp 30 degree angle. This intersection was known to be a danger to motorists, especially from trains coming from the east. In May of 1923, 30-year-old milkman Thaddeus R. Patterson of Wheaton, father of three children, was out making milk deliveries in the early morning when his milk truck collided with the passing ca &E train at the Weesbrook Road crossing. Mr. Patterson did not survive the crash. One of the most profound tragedies that occurred along the Aurora branch happened about midway between the Weisbrook station to the west and the Plamondon station to the east. 
It was the middle of the morning on May 19, 1913. The Stewart family had just moved to Wheaton from Chicago three weeks prior, feeling that the country air would be beneficial for their three children. They had moved temporarily into the Harry Hubbard Manor along Weisbrook Road, which once stood about where Stonebridge Court is today, about a half mile northeast of the Weisbrook Station. That morning, the Stewart children were playing in their large backyard, which backed on to the railway. In a moment of distraction, the youngest girl, a toddler, only 15 months of age, somehow ambled onto the railroad's right of way. In the distance, passengers on an Aurora-bound train were horrified to see the baby toddling towards the tracks as the train approached at 20 miles per hour. The motorman applied the brakes and blew a warning blast at the whistle but this may have only frightened the child into stumbling onto the tracks. Moments later, the toddler was hit and thrown by the impact. Her distraught mother rushed up just as they were taking the injured baby back to Wheaton via the train for medical care. But the little girl died shortly thereafter. The Chicago Golf Club stopped behind me. Today, a quiet oasis on the Aurora branch of the Illinois Prairie Path was the scene of a number of accidents. One of the AENC's first third rail accidents occurred here in June of 1903. Chicago Golf Club Vice President Alan L. Reed was departing the club and heading to his home in Wheaton via the train. when he inadvertently stepped upon the third rail, which shocked and threw him to the ground, his body falling onto the third rail, electrocuting and badly burning him. He survived the accident, although was badly scarred. Ten years later, a more deadly accident occurred here. In mid-September of 1913, 49-year-old August Schacht, an employee of the Chicago Golf Club, was waiting here at the station to take the midnight train to Wheaton near his home. Mr. Schacht sat down on the concrete platform and extended his legs out onto the rails to rest them, soon falling fast asleep. The imminent train, which he had expected to take him home, instead soon arrived to take his life. He was buried in Wheaton Cemetery. What we know today as Roosevelt Road, which stretches from the city of Chicago through the western suburbs, was once referred to as Chicago Avenue, hence the CA&E's Emory at Chicago station name. Not surprisingly, this busy road and railroad crossing saw its share of accidents over the years. On the evening of April 4th, 1940, Mike Sparopoulos, a fruit merchant from Batavia, was driving his truck along Chicago Avenue when his vehicle was struck by a CA&E train as it passed through the crossing. The one-car train was derailed None of the passengers were injured, but Mike Sparopoulos did not survive the accident. We'll close out this chapter of the CA&E Accidents and Tragedies series here in St. James Farm, part of the DuPage County Forest Preserve District, along the Aurora branch of the Chicago, Aurora, and Elgin Railway. Although the railway did bring great benefits to many of the communities through which it traversed. We cannot overlook that it also brought great pain and even death to some members of the community. We hope this video has given you a few thoughts to ponder. Please like, subscribe, and share the video. And leave us a comment. We'd love to hear from you.